Wesley Chapel, good morning. Blessing to have you here on this July the 23rd of 2023 here at Wesley Chapel United Methodist. If you're joining us in person, welcome. Watching online, we are blessed to have you here on our Facebook live stream. Folks, as we prepare ourselves for worship today, our Wesley Chapel choir for our prelude will bring to us this morning, Change My Heart, O God. Brothers and sisters, if you will bow your heads with me as we begin this morning with our opening prayer. Lord, we are so thankful to once again be in your presence, to be in your house, to worship and praise you. We give you thanks for another day the end of a long week, and the promise of a new one to begin. This morning, as we center upon you, we lay at your feet our needs, our concerns, our hopes, our dreams, and all our desires. For it is you we seek, and it is in you we shall find transformation. Teach us your ways, O oh God. In your most heavenly name we pray. Amen. Folks, if I invite you to stand as you are able for our opening hymn this morning that will be on the PowerPoint in front of you. Blessed be the tie that binds.
God's people said. Brothers and sisters, you may be seated. Congregation, as our choir takes their seats amongst you, our affirmation of faith today is from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12, and 23 through 24. And as always, as I read the words in italics, I invite you to join me with the words in bold. And I want to say, pay particular attention to the words that you are saying because you will see them again in the sermon in the not-too-distant future. Will you pray of me? O oh God, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You pursue me behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Whither shall I go from your spirit? Or whither shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me and the light above me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Folks, our special music today is going to be brought to us by Miss Emma Shepperson. That's the last name I believe we are all familiar with. She's going to bring to us this morning for her first piece. What a beautiful name. Emma, welcome. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation And now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ, my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of 
death could not hold you, the veil torn before you, you silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever God you reign, yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names, what a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of of Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Well said. Amen. What a powerful name it truly is. Brothers and sisters, for our first reading today, BJ is going to bring to us a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 12 through 25. Therefore, brother, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put death the mis misdeeds of the body, you will believe, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive for you did not receive the Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear but receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be received in us. The creation waits for, in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected for the creation was subjected to the frustration not by its own choice but by the will of the, of the one who is subjected to it and hope that the creation itself will be obliterated from its bondages to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but, our, our, but we ourselves who are not the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adaptation, excuse me, our adopt, adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in the hope we are saved, but the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not ha yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
invite our ushers forward for this morning's gifts, tithes, and offerings. And as the ushers come forward, Miss Emma Shepherson will sing for us again, More Like Jesus. of me take everything yes all of you is all I need take everything you are my life and my treasure feed my desires and dreams I lay down. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Whoa, Lord, change me like only you can. Here with my heart in your hands. Father, I pray you make me more like Jesus. This world is dying to know who you are. You've shown us the way to your heart. Father, I pray you make me more like Jesus. Make me more like Jesus. Make me Jesus. Praise God for all. Lord, we seek to be more like you. And because all that we have is yours, we return this portion back to you for transformation, not just for ourselves, but for these gifts and for a world in need of you, that your kingdom of heaven may be realized in our lives and in our reality. Lord, bless these gifts. In your most heavenly name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Folks, you may be seated. As always, it's a time in our service where we take a moment to pray together in our prayers of the people, and in a few moments when we go into that silent prayer, if there are names you want to lift up for our community to pray for, speak them into the silence. If you're watching online, put them in the comments, and we will share them with our church family. Folks, Ralph Walker had surgery uh, this week, uh, this past Monday. It was longer than expected, but it was successful. And Ralph is now home, uh, a long road of recovery, so if you will keep him and Leona in your prayers, 
And also, if you will keep um, Maria and Claude Baker in your prayers as uh, they celebrated uh, Gloria Rose's life yesterday, if you will keep the Baker family in your prayers. Also, folks, if you will be in prayer for our friends at the uh, Recovery RVA, uh, the first Spurn Up Hope graduation is Tuesday, August the 1st. So it's been a long time since they've been able to have a class, and the first group of five individuals will be graduating the first step of their process. So if you will keep the entire community, our brothers and sisters, in your prayers. Congregation, let's go to God in prayer. Pray with me. Ann Johnson, Aubrey and Betty Blanks, Aubrey Jr., Barrett Madeline and Marin White, our Wesley Chapel youth, our church committees, our church. Lord, we feel your spirit in this place. We were reminded in song this morning, Lord, of how beautiful your name is and how we should all try to be a middle, little more like you. Lord, that sounds like a very daunting task. Especially as we find ourselves in the world that your hands created, but that we tend to make a mess of. Lord, there is so much in our lives of which we have no control over. We are called to respond in a non-confrontational, peaceful way. There are times, Lord, when decisions we make cause dire consequences for ourselves and others. And in our places of despair or crisis, you call us home to you. But perhaps, Lord, today, some of us may be somewhere in the middle where life is okay. We're not too stressed. But we're simply taking one step at a time. Wherever we find ourselves, Lord, 
we welcome it. For those of us in need of your healing and your comfort, you reach out to us. For those of us with reason to celebrate, to bask in the experience of your blessings, you pat us on the back and smile alongside us. And if it, Lord, we're making it but day to day, you walk just a little ahead, holding our hand and reminding us that we are never alone. So today, Lord, where we are, we see you, we proclaim your name, and we will try as individuals, as one family, as one body of Christ, to do our best to be a little more like you. Lord, it is this prayer we offer as one body, along with the names and the places that we have mentioned, that we have written online, or that we have shared only with you. Lord, we place them at your feet, and we pray together in the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, folks, I think it's time for our children's message, so I'm going to invite our many kids forward. Taylors, how are we doing? Rogers, how are we doing? Miss Hughes, how are you? Thomas, how are you, buddy? Let's make room for Thomas. Awesome. Boston boys, how are we doing? So, does anybody want to say it? Great answer, Grace. And say what? Well, how about this I start? Thank you, Henry. What? Okay, so, full disclosure, right before we began the worship service, I had two young men, and I'm not going to mention names here, but they ran up to me and they said, Patrick, can we have children's message at the beginning of the service? And I'll be honest with the two young men who came up, they had been talking beforehand. You know what they were saying? We want to go play. We want to go to children's church and play. And I could see them talking about this. And they thought, we're going to go ask Pastor Patrick. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, yeah, let's get it out of the way so you can go play. Do you know what I said? Well, you, you think I said no? I told the young men who will not be named, I said, I am touched that you think I have that kind of power. Yes, I'm the pastor? That is the best thing I have heard all day. Okay. Somehow, you know what happened when you guys asked, can we get it done early? Do you know God was talking to you guys about that? Because you know what I was going to talk about at Children's Church today? Patience. What what do you guys know about patience? Anything? Are you good at it? Tom, are you good at patience? If you're good at waiting, raise your hand. Temper. Kemper, why, are you so, why do you think you're so good at... I'm going to ask you first before I look at your parents. Why are you so good at being patient? Um, when someone tells me to wait, I do wait and I don't say, like, hurry up. It's, it's good on the busy days. 
So when somebody asks you to be patient, you try it on, you don't like get super annoying or get really demanding. And have you ever done the opposite? Have you ever tried to be non-patient, been like, stop what you're doing, do what I want? I have done it a few times. But <laughs> How did it go? <laughs> they said, wait, I hate that. Okay. You want to get it done. If you are not good at patience, raise your hand. What do you mean, Colin? You're kind of patient and kind of not patient? I can get on board with that. Are you guys totally impatient all the time or just sometimes? All the time. So what do you do? Like when you want something, what do you do? You ask a million times? And they keep on saying, no, isn't that the worst? Who are the people that, that ask you to be patient more than most? Parentals. Mom and dad. And parents? Why do you think they want you to be patient? Because they're doing something. Okay. What if they're not, the, they're not doing something sometimes when they say that? They're always doing something. You're right. They're still going to say no if they're not doing anything? Whoa. They're busy. Now, Ella, why do you have air quotes about they are busy? Because they're not doing anything. Whoa, whoa, Kemper, we're talking about doing things dangerous? Whoa, whoa. You can't burn. Actually, I'm not going to say that. Would it be accurate, Kemper, that there have been Sundays when you've come at Children's Message and I've told you, don't break anything and take your time. And after, when you've said yes, have there been instances maybe where later that day, I find out that you're at patient first with a cast on. Yes. Okay. Wait, not, not on Sunday, but, uh, but soon a few days that week. Later, like a few days soon later. that week, yes. Okay. <laughs> so essentially, after telling you to be patient, within a couple of hours or days, you get impatient and stuff can happen. Yeah. So you could get hurt, right? Mm -hmm. Your parents could be doing something that you don't know what it is. You just get impatient about that? Girl, I understand. They just say no. I won't tell him. What, what do you want to say? <laughs> Take my mic off? Okay. I just want to say this, as a newly created adult, I'm going to back your dad to the hilt on that. I'm not going to say anything, because if I say you are right, it's going to come back and bite me. Can we play video games? Can we play video games? We can't yet. Well, here's the thing with patience. Is it easy? Especially when you want to do stuff. Yeah. Okay. So you know how we fix this it patience, impatience thing? No. Great answer. This... Exactly, Mr. Rogers. Exactly. This is what we're going to do. There are all these things 
that I talk with the adults about being a disciple, about being a follower of Jesus, and one of the things we have to do is be patient. Mm -hmm. But it can be tough, right? Yes. Amen. It can be aggravating, right? Yes. Especially when we want to do things. Yes. Yeah. So this is what we're going to try to do today, okay? okay? Because I struggle with patience too. I want you all to cross your legs like I've got. Most of you have done it. Do your prayer hands. And I have a very simple prayer that we're going to try, okay? And I want you to repeat after me. Well played, Kemper. Teach me your ways, O oh God. I'm going to try it one more time. Teach me. Your ways, O oh God. Let's do it one more time. Teach me your ways, O oh God. Do you know what you just did? Yes, you made it to the end of children's message. So now that we've done repeating everything I've said, I see what you did. Can you try that this week? Maybe. Can you try it, Mr. Rogers? Can you try it, Mr. Rogers? I have lost y'all, haven't I? I was just sending them children's church. You want to just go to children's church? All right, let's see. You want to pray first? Let's pray first. Congregation, will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God, thank you, thank you for, this day, for this day, for reminding me, for reminding me that patience, patience is a challenge, a challenge. And, we and we need you, need you to, help to help us, us. Because, because we love you. We love you. Amen. You want to go to Children's Church and play? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. If you guys will go with mom slash Mrs. Taylor and Mrs. Hughes, y'all have a great day, okay? Thomas, did you want to go to Children's Church? Did you want to go or did you want to go back to mom? You want to go back to mom? Okay, you can go. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Just do it? Well, Jack, we're going to find out, aren't we? We are going to find out. And actually, I'm glad you said that, Jack. Um, folks, as we get started today, it was at uh, Gloria Rose's Celebration of Life yesterday. And uh, right before the service, Jack came up, and he said, uh, Patrick, there's two folks that used to be members of Wesley Chapel that I want you to meet that were in the back of the fellowship hall at Second Presbyterian. And he said, do you have a second I'd like you to meet him? Well, yeah, absolutely. So stood up, went back to meet him. Jack introduced him. And you know what Jack said? As he introduced me to them, he said, and I quote, I want you to know that this is a pretty laid-back guy. I thought to myself, Jack, that's a nice thing to say. I, I am a laid-back guy. And then he said to him, well, because you see him in pants, and I had my sports blazer on, he said, he's not normally dressed like this. He's really relaxed at church. you got to come see it in person. It's like, you know what? Yeah, we are kind of relaxed here, right? Amen? Folks, I'm glad you're here. We, uh, for those who have not been with us the past couple weeks, we're doing a sermon series, as some of you know, on what it means to be a disciple. We talk about that word, disciple, discipleship, what does it mean? And we're going through this sermon series. Again, it's going to take us up through uh, Labor Day. And every week, I'm going to have for you a word or a phrase that I want you to think about for the coming week about what it means to be a disciple. 
and we're going to continue in the Gospel of Matthew. We have been in Matthew 13. We're going to continue through Matthew 13 into next week. And this is the time when Jesus is teaching the people in parables. And folks, the people aren't hearing what Jesus is teaching. And Jesus is getting a little aggravated. So the next part of Jesus' teaching is going to take us into Matthew chapter 13. So this morning we're going to hear verses 24 through 30. And then we're going to hop over to verses 36 through 43. And this is the parable of the weeds. Let us hear now the word of God. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then the enemy went away. When the wheat sprouted and it formed heads, the weeds also appeared. That morning the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did all these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. So the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them all up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat that is with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Verse 36. Then Jesus left the crowd and he went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. So Jesus said, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of God's kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and they are burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the path of the disciple. Actually, I have to tell you all about this image. Carla already knows where I'm going with this. So three weeks ago when we debuted this, I had one of our kids come up, and they, they brought up the bulletin at the end of service, and they said, Patrick, 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 how did you get your picture on the bulletin? And I was like, what are you talking about? Because, I mean, folks, I, I approve the bulletin, but what, what goes on the front, I've got no control over. It's like, if it's on there, it's great. So I, I half looked at it, and I said, I don't see myself. They said, no, Patrick, look, it's you. So look at your bulletins. <laughs> Mr. Henry Taylor came up to me this morning, and he said, Patrick, that's you. That looks like the back of your head. <laughs> Folks, I'll be straight with you that this is a stock image from the United Methodist worship page for this sermon series. If they got a hold of a picture of me, I should be expecting royalties. <laughs> so I'm speaking that into existence on our live stream. So if anybody in Louisville, Kentucky, at the base of the discipleship team, 
for the United Methodist Conference. If you're watching this, you'll be hearing from my lawyer soon. Because <laughs> that's a rather uncanny resemblance. And that's a journey. And folks, the reason I bring this up is because as we're talking about what it means to be a disciple, when I'm preaching, I'm talking to myself too. This is not me reading the scripture and then telling you what you need to do. This is me reading the scripture, speaking to you to invite you to join with me in trying these things of what it means to be a disciple and truly trying to follow Jesus Christ. That's us doing it together. God's just happened to call me to share it, but you better believe that the expectation is that I will try it on for size and I will take that journey with you. So for the past couple weeks, we've had some of these bullet words of what it means to be a disciple, and we can go to the next slide to see some of those. Two weeks ago when we started, the word was come, show up, be present, be ready, but come. Come. Last week, we talked about planting and growing. And I asked you some questions. What are the seeds you're planting? Are they your seeds? Or are they God's seeds that God's laid on your heart to share? And rather than worrying about how someone else is growing in their pot, worry about what's in yours. Are you in a place on your faith journey where you're going to take root and you're going to bear the fruit that God intends for all of God's people. Plant and grow. So this week, for week number three, patience and steadfastness. Patience and steadfastness. Well, I've already outed myself that the children's message Patience is a struggle, let's say. And I would assume, without asking for somebody to share their thoughts, that I could be a struggle as well. A simple nod of the head, or a laugh will suffice, or not making eye contact. Absolutely! I can be a lot. Last week I talked to you about, when we talked about planting and growing of that stretch of Winter Park Road coming off of Hull Street where they've been doing that construction on widening the lanes for the past three or four years. Air quotes, allegedly. So, I remember when a couple years ago we bought our house and when we were looking at it, I was blown away with the immaculate nature of the yard. The plants in the front yard looked great. Everything was cultivated perfectly. The landscaping was top-notch. And there was this lush, green grass in the backyard that you could not tell the difference between the end of my yard and the beginning of the fairway right behind the house. I was enamored. It was beautiful. Beautiful. Not that I want anybody to chip off of my yard back into the fairway, but it was that nice you could, and I loved it. And that first six to ten months, we moved in on Memorial Day a couple years ago, and for that first close to a year, the yard was immaculate, and I was so proud of it. I didn't realize this is something you hit as a middle-aged homeowner, that all of a sudden the yard has great meaning to me, and being in a unnamed competition with the other people in my cul-de-sac on whose yard looks better, all of a sudden I was in a competition and I was proud of my yard. And I'd find myself looking out my front yard 
and seeing people walk by with their dogs and stopping and looking at my landscaping and I felt like the king of a castle sitting there saying, yes, this is all mine. <laughs> and then disaster struck. It was almost a year to the day we moved in. And we come back from vacation, it was time to cut the yard. And there was things growing out of my lush green backyard that did not look like Scott's turf builder. It was weed. It was a lot of weeds. It was clover. Then I cut it and it went away. But the next year, it got worse. Now there is moss in my backyard. There's all kinds of weeds. There's more weeds than there's actually grass. And I realized something. Previous owners had true green. And so I thought about it for a second. I was like, you know what? Maybe they're on to something. I'm going to check this out. Heck no, I saw what it cost. No way. I can handle this yard. This is my domain. So you know what I did? I went to Lowe's. I bought some lime. I brought some turf builder. I loaded up my spreader, and I hit the yard. Remulched, pulled weeds. Trimmed bushes. It looked immaculate. And I read that when you put down the lime, that it's going to kill out the moss, it's going to fix the acidity of my yard. Things I never thought of years ago. Check the acidity of my lawn. The pine trees are not a good thing if you want to grow grass. They said it would transform your yard right away. Folks, it did not happen. Nothing happened when I put down the lime. In fine print, on the back of the bag of lime, it said, it would be best if you did this early in the fall, early in the spring, to see the best results. So why do I share that with you? Because I wanted my yard to look like True Green did it without paying True Green at all. And I wanted it yesterday. I did not want it allegedly next year. All of a sudden, I got very hot under the collar looking outside and seeing all these weeds. All of a sudden, people on the fairway weren't paying any attention to my yard. They just looked for their balls could care less. Nobody walked by and stared. I wanted things the way I wanted them, and I wanted it yesterday. But it seems that unless my yard goes through major surgery, it is going to be a process. I thought I was a patient man. I'm not going to ask people to explain. But the yard, I'm not patient with. The things I want, I wanted yesterday. Why is that? Now, that's a rather funny look at life for me. It may be an odd thing to mention where I am impatient. But I would venture to say that we've all had instances in our lives, if not recently, but in some point, where we have wanted an outcome... And even knowing that there is a process to follow, we want the results when we want them. And the fact is, folks, the way our world is conditioned today, everything is right now. Everything's right now. If I want something off Amazon, all I have to go do is go to the app, type it in, click buy, and now that I've got everything so streamlined, I don't even have to uh, no longer put in my address or how I'm going to charge it. It's all pre-programmed. In three clicks, I can have something delivered before I get home. And sometimes that's still not fast enough. Everything online or on social media is breaking news. Put, if you put the emojis of the flashing lights next to something, it draws attention. 
We want the latest thing right now. And everything in this world is about doing it faster, doing it better, getting it right now. And that's not how the kingdom of God works. And that's exactly, brothers and sisters, what Jesus is talking about. Patience and steadfastness. If we are to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to be patient and steadfast. Now, steadfast, steadfastness, is one of those big churchy words. So it's probably a good thing that we define it, and this is the faith definition for steadfastness when we read in the Bible, to be firm and unwavering in our faith. Firm and unwavering. One of the toughest things, brothers and sisters, and you've heard me mention this before, is visiting folks or being around people who have terminal illness. Especially after seeing some of these folks and after they have met with their doctors or caregivers and the medical team says, we've done all we can. And they may get sent home with hospice or sent to a place to live out the rest of their days. There's one lady in particular that I was thinking about when I was considering steadfastness today. Her name was Ann Thaxton. And she was a person that God used to invite me to consider turning my life back to Christ. And I've told you that story before. It happened on a Christmas Eve. And she was the first person to meet me at my home church when I had not been there in five or six years. And she took me in a great big embrace. She hugged me and said, whispered in my ear, Patrick, it is good to have you home. And she was not talking about being back in Lynchburg, Virginia. She was talking about being back in God's house. A lost sheep back in the fold. That's what she was talking about. And I had the privilege of being her pastor for two years. And when she was diagnosed with cancer, she was given about a 10% chance to live. And I remember going to see her in the hospital, folks, and this was before I had spent my time as a chaplain at MCV and learned how to handle these things. But one of the things that really bothered me early on in hospital visits was seeing the person and not the body connected to all the machines. I really struggled with that. And if you've been in those situations, you know what I mean. And Miss Thaxton was hooked to every machine. And not to be too graphic, but they were having to pump five to six times the fluid on her body that the cancer was creating, and she was constantly hooked to a pump to suck that out. And she had five or six across her body. And she was covered in a blanket. And I was very unnerved by that. And she could tell that I was struggling. And she looked at me and she said, Patrick, don't worry about all this because it doesn't matter what's going to happen. God is sitting right here by my side. I was supposed to go there, folks, to provide pastoral counseling. I failed miserably because she pastored me. And I share that story with you, brothers and sisters, because I found so often that people in these terminal 
places in life have this incredible grasp of what being firm and unwavering in their faith is all about. She knew God was there. And no amount of pumps or pain or morphine or trips up and down to the ICU was going to stop that. And before I left that day, she said, Patrick, they're going to pump out all this stuff out of my bilge, but they can't touch what God has placed in my heart. I had a conversation with a member of our church after a loved one had received a terminal diagnosis, and I asked them a question. How are you? And their words to me were this. My loved one's fine. She knows where she's going. What about me? We're making it. This thing that God invites us to do, brothers and sisters, of being firm and unwavering in our faith, that is tough. And when we throw patience into that, into this world that God created, but yet human beings can make a mess of, when we are demanded to be patient, but also at the same time to be firm and unwavering in our faith and a steadfast nature, how in the world do we do that? I'm an impatient man. And I've got to try to be firm and unwavering in my faith. I'm not supposed to have doubt. I'm not supposed to have fear. I'm not supposed to question. How do I do it? The truth is, brothers and sisters, nothing in being firm and unwavering does it say, I can't struggle with doubt, I can't have fear, I can't have questions, I can't have concerns, I can't reach out for help, I can't pray, I can't do these things. It doesn't say any of that. It says firm and stay the course. I said this the other week, brothers and sisters, but I think it's important as we talk about patience and steadfastness to say this again. In the entirety of the Gospels, Jesus has asked close to 300 questions. He answers only eight of them. The rest of them, he invites us to wrestle with and to put our faith in the God who is always firm and never unwavering when God shows up in our best and in our worst moments. I said at the very beginning, brothers and sisters, that in this sermon series, as any Sunday I get up and preach to you, that I'm applying this to my life as much as I'm inviting you to do it with me. So as an impatient man, how am I supposed to become patient and steadfast in trusting that God's time will be the time? And if I see something that doesn't quite look like God in the world, why can't I just go and rip it up? Wouldn't that be easy? The funny thing is, brothers and sisters, what Jesus says is, wait and let me do the work. Jesus says, when they ask the question, when he tells the story of the parable, can't we just go and rip up the weeds and... The answer is no, you may disturb the wheat. Let life take its course. Let me be in control. And when the time is right, I will make the decision. 
But there's a lot between the beginning and the end of life, brothers and sisters, where God gives us ample opportunity to get it right. I will tell you that in my impatience and where I've fallen short of the glory of God in my life, I was, a lot of the time, I was the weed in someone else's yard. I was the moss. I was the crabgrass. I was the clover. And God had to work on me. God still works on me. To the point of, I want to be wheat. I want to be wheat. And praise to God that at the times in my life when I've been a weed, God hasn't allowed people to just pluck me up and throw me on the fire. Amen? God calls for patience because God's not done with us yet. As it turned out, Ann Thaxton survived that entire ordeal. She was with us for another two and a half years. Her strength was not the same. What she used to do at church was not the same. But this, this was stronger than ever. And on her deathbed, her words were this. I sure hope I didn't pluck a lot of weeds. I hope I invited others like me to grow into wheat. God's not done with us yet, brothers and sisters. If you're a weed right now, I got you, brother. I understand. God gives us time. God gives you time. God gives me time. Because there's a lifetime on offer to grow into who God's really calling us to be. So don't be so ready to go to the next thing to pluck up, throw away, and forget. Because sometimes in that process, God uses that time to teach, to love, and always transform. Sometimes I'm grass. A lot of times I'm a weed. But yet God says, give them time. Remember, didn't I give that to you? Patience and steadfastness. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, before we sing our final hymn today, The last thing of my sermon I want to say is this. How do we get to that point of being patient and steadfast? Well, why don't we ask God? What I'm going to invite you to do is repeat after me. Raise your hands if you'd like to. And we're going to say a simple prayer three times. We're going to say, teach me your ways, O God. Repeat after me. Teach me your ways, O God. And then we're just going to sit in the silence for a second. Will you join with me? Teach me your ways, O God.
Teach me your ways, O God. Teach me your ways, O God. And all God's people said, Amen. Folks, I invite you to stand for our final hymn this morning. It's rather fitting that as we try on patience and steadfastness for a change, Jesus lives, God reigns, and it's a beautiful thing. Sing with me. Folks, you may be seated. We have a quick announcement that Maria is going to bring to us, and then I will offer you all the benediction. Have I got it here? Yay! Okay, we have some exciting news about our music program. With the help of Mike Crawford, we are now able to do our rehearsals by Zoom. So each week when I send out the choir news, I'll be including a link to our um, Zoom contact, Zoom meeting for rehearsals. So any of you who are interested in joining the choir and want to join our rehearsals but can't make the trip here during the week due to work or other things, this will be a way that you can join us. Or if you're just curious about what we're doing, do, doing during rehearsals, you can tune in. So we would love to have you join us. I will ask you to be patient because, like anything else and with technology, we will probably have some bugs to work out. So hang in there with us and give me some feedback. So thank you very much.
Jack, watch what you say, man. You might get on loudspeaker. I'm just telling you. Maria, I appreciate the plug for patience. Uh, awesome. I appreciate that. Folks, uh, Maria said it. We'd love to have you. If you can't make it, join us online. It'd be a great thing to have you part of it. Folks, when uh, we talk about what it means to be a disciple, come, plan to grow, and today, patience and steadfastness. As great it would be for us to accomplish, accomplish this right away, it takes some work, amen? Nothing about this path of the Christian is easy. But we're giving it a go. We're trying it on for size because God did it for us and doesn't want us to miss out. So go forth, be a blessing, just as you've been a blessing here, You'll notice there are black backpacks along the side of the Family Life Center that we've been collecting for a camp that the sheriff's office is putting on. We needed 60. Wesley Chapel, you collected 70 plus. That deserves a round of applause, I believe. And our benediction today, folks, if you will reach out your hands to that table, we're going to bless it for the children that are going to receive it. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, as we try to be patient and steadfast, may these gifts go forth to transform the people in the world and to remind us that your hand is always upon us. Guide us, bless us, and transform these young people that in their time together they may recognize the love, grace, and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Lord, may everything we do give honor and glory to you. In your most heavenly name we pray, and all God's people said, folks, have a blessed week, and I'll see you next week. Take care.